Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guest is Elizabeth Glassman, President and CEO of the Terra Foundation for American Art. Thank you for joining us, Elizabeth, and a reminder to our webinar guests that you can ask questions through the Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. Liz, it's so great to have you. We've known each other for, for a while. You've helped us on a lot of different uh, engagements and, and uh, you've given us advice over the years. Um, talk about Tara's role today. We're, we're in lockdown. People are not visiting museums. We're, we're about to open up, of course. But during the last months, this has been a challenge for us all. How have you met that challenge? Well, first of all, hello, everyone. And thank you, Mark, for having us. Um, me. And, um, you know, it's been a, a wild ride, right? I mean, we all started with the kind of growing awareness of the seriousness and the depth to which this would affect our constituents and our country and the world. And um, we started by talking about the local needs. And we closed our office on March 13th. Um, everyone in my office is extremely busy. We don't have front of house people. Everyone's working from their computers and thank goodness for all of these Zoom meetings. But it soon became apparent that the um, group in Chicago was creating a fund um, called Arts for Illinois Relief Fund. And we definitely wanted to participate. And from that, we began to grow our awareness of what we needed to do to help make our constituents continue to thrive, that we needed to do emergency funding. And to that end, we came out with a um, program um, that would give emergency relief to um, museums around the country, as well as some organizations, and in Chicago and internationally, groups that we had already given grants to to give them funding for general operating programs, whatever they needed. And that was about a $4 million fund. But from the beginning, we've also been very aware of the needs that will happen as we begin to recover. And that's when I'm really concerned that with museums not having the earn, earned income that they might have otherwise, if we were able to just open, which we won't be able to do. So we also have a $4 million recovery fund that we will be announcing um, in the summer, the parameters for that, and people can start applying at that time. So if, if we visualize a map of the United States, the thing that we, we really need to appreciate are all the small institutions, the ones that are not covered in the press, the ones that are not on the uh, media circuit at all, but are so important to the lifeblood of each and every community. And they're, they're, they're unique, they have their own character. They're, they're um, supported by a cohort of volunteers and small professional staffs. They don't have much bandwidth to weather the vicissitudes of, of something like a, clo a, a shutdown. And then reopening itself is also, there are all these question marks. What happens when we have school children coming in and what, you know, what parents are going to be uh, afraid? How do we do social distancing? Um, how do we ensure that if we have uh, uh, older members of our community come in, that they are not uh, made vulnerable, even if uh, the younger people seem to be asymptomatic? There, there's so much risk there. How do you deal with that in terms of just sharing information? How do you ensure that people are talking to each other through your own uh, grant making and, and, um, and knowledge clearinghouse function that Tara uh, uh, occupies? You know, it's an interesting um, position that a philanthropy group is in. We aren't opening a museum. We're there to support the people who are. So we do participate like everyone else by listening tremendously. I call the constituents. I watch your show. Um, I will be, I think everyone, all the museums will be looking at the example of the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, which has opened and how they're doing. What it, one thing that I'm finding in this particular moment is that everyone is coming together in the art sector, the museum sector, to listen to each other, to share information, to be very honest about the challenges they're facing, rather than simply um, 
broadcasting their numbers of attendees, et cetera. That's been incredibly gratifying to create these communities of conversation, which is something that the Terra has been trying to do on the subject of American art all over the world and in Chicago and in, in the United States for many years now. Um, and I do think that there are the technical issues that will be faced, but there's also the emotional issues. And as you know, Culture Track COVID-19 is going to be uh, releasing a study soon that will tell us a tremendous amount about what people are thinking. But you have to be, it's like, as you know, you have to be a head with many antennas listening to all the voices and to sort of find your, your lane where you can make a difference in addition to supporting what others are doing. So we will be partnering where we can with other foundations to amplify our funding. Um, no one foundation has the funds to do it all. So I really believe in using money for leadership, using it to impact um, a, a, a kind of um, need that might exist out there for, um, in, in our case, for example, in this recovery fund, we'll be focusing on um, exhibitions or gallery shows in museums that, have, that use the permanent collection because that will be something that museums will definitely be looking to. We'll also be thinking about museums that are looking in, to tell new stories, new narratives. You know, we have a mission statement and the last line of it is we believe the art has the power to distinguish cultures and to unite them. And that's true internationally, but it's also true nationally. And so we will be looking to see what kinds of new narratives museums want to bring forth. I mean, ultimately, we are the catalyst, but they are the people, they're really the people who are leading us to say this is what we're looking for as well. So it's a dual, it's a dual track of, of conversation. You raised so many interesting points there. Um, you raised Gary's work, Gary Tintero's work in, in Houston and how he functions as a regional leader in a uh, ecosystem of different museums and how his example and his support is so important. And, and if you take a look throughout the United States, there are these types of institutions. So that knowledge sharing is so important. You also raise the whole idea of storytelling and you raise the, the idea of using uh, collections that people have because it's going to be much more difficult to travel collections uh, in the future. So looking back at your own uh, resource, you also point to the whole idea of an integrative experience in which the curators, the storytellers, the citizens are all in dialogue about how this art is relevant today. And, and, and then you also raise the whole international perception. And when we look at what's going on in the news, there is no time in this country where the news is replete with not only discussions about the, the coronavirus situation, but the, the, uh, the death, uh, can we say, um, uh, murder of, of, a, of a black man in, uh, at the hands of, of law enforcement um, and the outrage that people are feeling. So you, you have all these emotions. How does art inform either internationally or nationally to allow people to process this trauma. I mean, it seems like we're, we're, we're stacking trauma on top of trauma. How do, we, how do we use art to get us through this, this time? And it, it, it's not a vacuous question, my goodness. It is not. And it's interesting, someone sent me a, um, a, a, a photograph of a piece of graffiti in their neighborhood in Los Angeles. And the, someone had written, the time for art is over. And someone crossed out over and put now. And I really believe that. I think that artists lead the way often. <clears throat> um, I was looking this morning at the Robert Rauschenberg large painting called Signs from 1970, where it's all there. The good, the, the, the space launch, which we also have now, hmm. the riots, Janis Joplin, Martin Luther King. We, we, we artists help us filter all of these conflicting and troubling emotions 
and um, give us a, a lane to talk about some of these things. You know, as a foundation, we're, we have a responsibility to participate, but we also have to know what we can really change. We're not going to find the cure for the virus. Um, so what can we do? We can, I think we can um, continue as we are to create a, a space for conversation. And we try to model behavior in this smaller um, areas where we can make a difference to show other people what might happen. For example, we have a very large um, commitment to a program called Art Design Chicago, which we were inspired by Pacific Standard Time to start to say, well, what are the stories? What, what are the conversations that can happen here? What are the, what's the art that's been created here? Where have we been a crossroads for art in Chicago? And um, our team created with everyone, all the partners all over the city. So we had 95 partners. Um, we had constant, in addition to all the exhibitions and programs, we had constant um, convenings. And really the people who participated in that, the museums, the curators, the educators, all feel that we came out of that being more of a community of art organizations than we had. So we're going to do it again in 2024. And this time we will, we have already um, research fellows that will go and help amplify the stories that the museums want to tell in the Latino community, Native American stories, all of these come together in Chicago. But we're also going to have engagement fellows so that these will be a coterie of people who will be in working in the museums to help them from now begin to um, forecast to their audiences in the neighborhoods what will be the opportunities for them to be part of this. And so it's not just sort of an exhibition, it comes and goes, but really a, an ongoing conversation for the next four years until we get to the, the point of the exhibition. And bringing people together to discuss in a safe space where art bridges culture and bridges division, where we can each have our perspective Right. We are engaging in movement building. We are engaging in healing. We are engaging in politics. Call it what you will, but it is a space where civil society becomes stronger because we are talking to each other about difficult, difficult topics, isn't it? Yes, and that safe space is something um, another museum leader who's a close friend and colleague and who I talk with along with Gary, is Matthew Teitelbaum, and I'm sure you saw he issued a very poignant yes. statement um, from his museum. And I know today is the Blackout Tuesday, but I'm sure there will be other statements tomorrow. Um, and I think they all point to the fact that, that we all have to take a stand and have a responsibility in the ways that we can to be aware, to um, to encourage these conversations and to um, continue to participate and to make these kinds of things happen. I noticed in the background, and, and one of our, our viewers uh, asked, what is the artwork that, that is in back of you? It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Actually, this is, I'm sitting in my dining room, and this is a um, gouache drawing by an artist from Houston, where I grew up, named John Biggers. John Biggers taught at the Texas Southern University and my parents met him and they, this was the first uh, work of art they ever bought. And through the family, this has come to me. And it seems as I woke up this morning and I thought maybe I should sit someplace else. I thought this is exactly the wonderful statement that we want to, um, that, that shows the power of art. And um, John Biggers was an artist who not only um, made art through his lifetime in Houston, but he nurtured a whole generation of artists and art historians and um, as did Mrs. de Manil, who I worked for and who had a gallery where you could lease a painting for a while and buy it. And that's how this came to my parents through that program. It's a wonderful story and it's a, it, it's a beautiful work. In terms of your 
taking that sensibility that you grew up with and sharing it with others, you also collaborate with a whole host of different museums, partners. Um, you've, you've worked with, uh, with Alice, um, Alice Walton for a while on, on her various initiatives, which have now been transformed into Art Bridges. Talk about the importance of having uh, partnerships where you can actually share not only sensibility and information and means, but also the whole idea of, of creating this dialogue uh, tying back to that earlier discussion that we had. Um, what kind of partners are you uh, working with as you try to ensure that American art is not only shared nationally, but also internationally? And how does that function? You know, I, I try to see it as a portfolio of partners. You know, you have some partners with whom you might fund, and for us, in our case, fund an exhibition. And that has come about because we have gone to the people, talked to them about how we might help them should they be interested in an American art show. And this is true in our European partners as well as many in South America, Asia. Um, it's a matter of meeting the people and having a conversation with them. But while we're there, we talk about their interests. Are they, do they have a topic about their own country maybe? Because to me, we're not in the business of exporting American art. We're in the business of creating conversations with people. And we all have a national story. Right. How does our national story take shape? How does another nation's story take shape? And where do we diverge? And it's again, our mission statement, where do we have distinguishing features and where do we have common features? So this gives us a platform for further conversation. We really like to have um, also find partners that are ongoing. So we have sustained partnerships with the National Gallery in London, with the Pinacoteca in Sao Paulo, and with others, um, the Shanghai Museum in Shanghai. So these are groups we've worked with in many iterations. And those are very gratifying because you don't have to continually in introduce yourself. So you can go a little farther. We also have academic programs. So teaching is important. How do we seed the field so that other people are also talking about American art, but not just to sort of go out there and say American art's the only art to talk about, but to use it as a way to talk about how, we, how does a nation show itself? How do the artists portray those moments and those, um, those experiences that they're having? Well, what you're saying is that your approach is not monologuing, right? Your, right. your, your approach is dialoguing so exactly. that you're exchanging and you're, you're receiving as much as you're giving. In, in American history, and, and it's reflected in American art, we have this very optimistic view. We have a very dark view. We have a very textured view. There is so much to different art styles and different messages that artists are conveying. Um, when you put together your, your various uh, exhibitions, how do you ensure that a, a truly textured understanding of uh, the thoughts of, of artists um, come across so that you don't, um, you don't end up getting um, captured by a single narrative. Right, right. Well, you know, that's the reason why it's so exciting. When we started in um, 2005 to give grants to international museums to do exhibitions on American art and to give grants to American museums to um, travel exhibitions, we had about 25% of our grant requests were from non-US museums. Now it's about 75%. So there is a hunger out there for other people and they all have different narratives. And that's the beauty of bringing more voices into this conversation is you have the opportunity to hear what someone else's point of view, you know, Soul of a Nation, which we were proud to fund both in, uh, at the Tate and in America. It, it was uh, non-US curators who, whose voices were heard there. Um, we also have diversified our own collection in buying works by Romare Bearden, Kuniyoshi, um, Jacob Lawrence and others so that when we go 
to, for example, to the Shanghai Museum, we had an exhibition of modernism in America with the Art Institute of Chicago, one of our very embedded partners. Um, the first time that the Chinese people see American art, they are going to see a very diverse um, population and a very diverse way of telling stories about what America is. So it's, it's having multiple voices so that we're not the only ones and the other people we support are also engaged in this. I, I'm, I'm so happy to hear about how you're doing this because this whole idea of monologuing, of creating our individual voices and then talking to our individual audiences, whether it's, it's a uh, media company or a media ecosystem in which we are ensconced or a, a social media uh, group where we are only talking to ourselves, that really leaves some of the rich texture of the fabric of this nation yeah. on the table, right? I mean, that's why we're Americans. We're Americans because we love these different perspectives and even the darker shades can serve to inform and perhaps prevent the, the, uh, the issue um, that we are facing now that comes from a lack of communication, a lack of understanding. We, we received a question about African-American uh, artists and, and the, um, the, the fact that so often uh, art collections in, um, in large institutions represent a, a European uh, kind of uh, uh, orientation. Um, how do you ensure that your collection reflects that rich, rich, rich tapestry of cultures that we have here in this country? Well, we have, you know, collections are wonderfully organic. Um, they grow, uh, the founder, Dan Terra, he had a certain kind of collection that I call a bicentennial collection. It was a moment of recognizing that American art was important and had something to say. Over the years, we've added to that. We have certainly his permission in terms of his own actions where he would change things in and out of his collection. And, um, oh, I would say maybe some years ago, maybe eight or so, we wrote a new collection plan in which we purposefully decided to, that we wanted more stories to tell in our own, through our own collection. So we, um, our, our most recent acquisition, um, well, not our most recent was probably a Roger Brown, but the most recent for, from that point of view was a beautiful bow for Delaney. And for us, we don't have a museum size collection, but we try to find, we look, we wait, we look for objects that will allow us to tell a bigger story. And that could be from many different points of view and we're always looking, but the beauty is um, what we don't have, we can borrow from one of our colleagues and that's how the museum world works. No one person wants, you know, can own works, we, we share. So when you look at the story of America, it's, it's interesting how in the retelling, um, we can gain more uh, new perspective. When I was growing up, the, the, the telling of the American Revolution, the telling of the, of the Civil War, um, they were about battles. They were uh, generally, all the depictions were, were white folks. Um, all of the history that was provided had uh, stout-hearted, uh, tall, uh, men with their chests out, standing up on boats and crossing uh, rivers and, and so on. And then now with, with time, we're finding that there are all these different stories and each of these stories have their own truth to them. Right. We have the, the stories of Native Americans and what they lived through during that uh, revolutionary era. We have the stories of African Americans and uh, what they experienced during the Civil War. We have the stories of women who were shunted aside in popular culture, but were definitely at the center of all the action throughout American history. It's, it, 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 it is time to break apart these divisions and really expose ourselves to what is happening, because if we do that, we can then create a world where what just happened uh, there in Minneapolis uh, does not happen again. Yeah, and we have to be patient and we have to look and think and be truthful and, um, 
and be empathetic and respectful. And we all need to show up that way. Um, we all need to show up. So as, as the country reopens um, and, and you are helping others to, to reopen, what comes next? What's happening in the next three months at your foundation and how are you uh, working to help other museums uh, to open up and, and stage their exhibitions? Well, as I said, we will be focusing on permanent collection support right. for, um, to both mount the shows, but also interpret as well as installations. So that will be an important part of what we're doing. We, we will continue to do all the things we've always done. We have international museums writing to us, applying for help. We will be formulating the next Art Design Chicago. I do want to mention one thing, Mark, and that is an irony with American art in that most of the collections of American art are in America. So it behooves us if we want to show a different face to the world to, to have those travel in either electronically or in books or in, in the physical form. But there are collections of American art in especially European museums. And right now, for example, we're working on finding, identifying collections of Native American art in European museums that went there during the time when America was not a nation, right. when the tribes were the nations, when there were sovereign nations trading with groups like France, Russia, England, Spain. Those are incredible collections that exist there and we are giving grants to help those museums bring over Native American um, specialists, tribal uh, specialists, to help them understand exactly what their holdings are and to begin to create those kinds of dialogues and those kinds of networks. And to me, those are the kind of things that will create a lasting conversation. When you bring people together around a subject that they're all interested in, they meet each other, they exchange, and those kinds of exchanges, and that's true in America too, that kind of conversations and connections will be the thing that will begin to shift our perspective. I'm so glad you mentioned that particular topic. It's, it's, it, it's at a time when, these collections were built at a time when in our nation, we were showing disrespect for these cultures and we find respect for those cultures coming in from Europe. We found the same thing during the Jazz Age and, and this rediscovery of this, the, these uh, cultural narratives, these objects that contain so much power is so much part and parcel of what you're about, Liz, and what you've always been about and what uh, Tara has been about. Thank you so much for sharing the work of the Tara Foundation uh, with us. Thank you for your work as we help to reorganize um, and, and reopen and reinvigorate uh, America through its, through its art exhibitions. And, and, um, and thank you all attendees for attending. That's the nonprofit report for today. Have a great day. Thank you.